Uh, how did you get involved with graffiti? Um, well, I, so I was born and raised in Queens, New York, and um, my brother was uh, a b-boy and, and a DJ and a graffiti writer back in the 80s, and uh, he was kind of like, you know, my cool older brother that I looked up, up to. And uh, back then I didn't know that, you know, hip-hop was coined hip-hop, but I was still dancing to, you know, Rapper's Delight and, you know, EPMD was one of the first, you know, albums I heard as a child, you know, so I think, um, you know, being involved just with my brother and his kind of outlook and his genre of growing up as, as someone in hip-hop really exposed me at a young age to all of the forms of hip-hop and graffiti was one of them. Um, I have a lot of respect for the movement and I feel very much part of it, but I also don't label myself a graffiti writer because I feel like it, it kind of, first of all, I don't do pieces, I'm more of a figurative painter, but I do use aerosol, so in a way I borrow from the movement in some, in some ways, um, but yeah. Labeling in the art world is tough, like any, of any artist it seems tough the labels that are applied very often they don't work. Yeah, yeah, it's because, you know, uh, as an artist I feel like I'm so much more than one thing and not just as an artist but as a human being. I have many skills and so if I apply a label to it, it kind of just restricts me. Right. So. What, um, um, it says here that you're a painter and a printmaker and I was just wondering what are, what are some of the advantages, uh, what, what are the pros and cons of both that, that you've cho chosen both those routes? So as a painter, uh, I l first off, I love both painting and printmaking. I feel like they're very much part of my practice in a regular kind of way. Um, I, I'm formally trained. I went to Parsons School of Design for my undergrad. And um, I did a semester abroad in Amsterdam where I learned uh, from some master printmakers out there, kind of a really old traditional ways of silk screening and printmaking. Um, before then, I had been also doing a lot of woodcuts and I really, really love kind of the aggressive line work of woodcuts and um, because I'm, I also find myself kind of a sculptor in some ways because I like to make installations and create spaces, um, printmaking is sort of like that. The process of it is, is almost like you're building and then at the end you get this print that's 2D, you know, but in the 3D space you're actually building something and then you get a result. Um, so for example, something like a woodcut, you actually have a 3D piece of wood and you're carving at it an image that is then going to transform into a 2D print. Um, and the same with silk screening, you have a, uh, a, a, you know, an actual frame that you're squeegeeing with ink through, which is a very kind of physical process and then um, and painting I mean painting is a little bit more I feel for me um, it's been a little bit more cerebral at sometimes where but also I go into the zone when I'm painting because each brush stroke is like a different texture that you're creating at that moment um, and, and I feel you know they're both wonderful but they they give you different effects you know right Okay. Um, one of your um, uh, one of your goals in painting that you've stated is elevating uh, females to sacred uh, archetypes, and I was just wondering if you could extrapolate on that a bit. Sure. Um, so I've done a lot of work um, with community and community building, and also specifically um, with women. Uh, I founded a women's art collective in two thousand six called Unity. Um, it was about 120 women worldwide that collaborated on exhibitions, murals, uh, panel discussions, mentoring, youth workshops. Um, and over the years, I mean, we've all collaborated and then done our own stuff as well. And now we've all kind of grown, so we've all gone our own ways. But, um, but I feel, you know, as, as a woman, you know, in this industry, in, in any industry as a woman, our experience is different, just as a man's experience is different. Um, but for me, I can only talk about the feminine experience because I'm a woman. So I oftentimes embrace that and focus on women's issues like uh, I sometimes bring in some mystical references of goddesses and deities and, uh, and also you know, pass that information down to young women um, who feel like they can elevate themselves to that place 
where they can kind of, you know, appear to be strong, confident, self-loving women who are part of the, the you know, this are, are empowering, growing, beautiful society, you know? And so, um, I don't preach it, I more like show it by example of the things that I do and then hope in turn that they'll take it and transform it into their own direction. And I was wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about your site-specific projects. Sure, so my site-specific work is, um, is you know, it always, it, it, it's always a reflection of the site, right? So, um, you know, in this case, we're, you know, graffiti art programming and, uh, and the graffiti art gallery in Winnipeg, Canada. And so in this space, you have a really large open space with tall, high ceilings, and it's very raw and industrial. Um, so I wanted to create kind of like a, a nebulous or an organic form where you walk in and you, you feel like you're somewhat in another land, right? So hence the name Wonderland. Um, and also there are subtle kind of references to Alice in Wonderland from, you know, Lewis Carroll, who I grew up, you know, everyone's always like, oh, Alice in Wonderland, Alice, Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. So, so definitely bringing some of those experiences into it. Um, or references, I should say, right? But then also thinking about the space and, and where it is and how it lives and what it feels like. So beforehand, Pat Lazo, the curator, uh, sent me a bunch of pictures in the floor plan of the space so I can get a real feel of it. Um, and then as weeks went by, I kind of had an idea of what I was going to do. But coming here, of course, I had the paintings that were shipped, but then I added things on based on what I felt at that moment. Um, another example is, you know, I, I did a show in Israel, in Tel Aviv, with a gallery that, um, that um, represents me. And at that time, they were ripping down um, a neighborhood called Amazgeo, which is the neighborhood that my parents were there often. My dad actually worked there as a young child, as a young boy, and then into his adulthood. Um, and they were ripping it down. It was full of body shops, and it was kind of like the restoration of that neighborhood, right? Kind of changing the climate of it. And, and so I went there and I saw all of these like pieces of metal that were rusted and probably there for a hundred years. And, mm -hmm. and just, so what I did was I took all of those pieces of metal and then brought them to the gallery and created an installation. And the installation was about the changing of that, that time, right? And also, kind of paying homage to it, remembering it, and also paying homage to my dad's childhood and really looking at where he came from and then migrated to give us a better life, right? To be able to live our dreams. And then I'm going now back mm -hmm. to revisit that and to kind of honor it and mm -hmm. acknowledge that that's where he came from and this is where his daughter is kind of linking mm -hmm. back to that. So oftentimes when I do site-specific work, I really try to focus on the place, the time, and the feeling that I have when I'm in that space. Of course, my ideas come into that, but, um, but I really try to come from an intuitive place and in the moment create what I need to. Cool. With that in mind, um, you mentioned that the space was industrial. Um, was the treatment that you've done of the space with pouring and the, and the color palette was it a way to soften the space up or de-industrialize it to a degree? Uh, the treatment of the space, um, when I first walked in, you know, well, like I said, Pat, Lazo, Pat sent me the photos of the place and uh, I kind of got an idea that it, that, that it was very square and very geometric, but full of angular lines, like the pipes and the triangles. And, and so I wanted to create a space where you walk in, where you almost feel like you're in a jungle, where you're really in an organic space. So it was a challenge to kind of, um, you know, think of a space that's square, but make it round, mm -hmm. right? So making it something that's inorganic, very organic. You know, so hence the trees and the dripping of the green and, and, and so, you know, the idea is to take something and to transform it to maybe visualize what you could do with it, kind of like an imaginary world, right? And we do that all the time as artists, right? We create from nothing to something. Sure. And we all do that, whether an artist or not, we all do that with our lives, right? So I always am challenged and 
interested in going into spaces and recreating that feeling from hard to soft. And it's actually a reoccurring theme that happens in my work because growing up, my dad was very hard and my mom was very soft. So oftentimes I'll work with metal, but then I'll, walk, I'll work with lace. Mm -hmm. So I, I try to mix the two and, and that's, you could see that a lot in my collage work as well. Here's an interesting question. Um, for in, in your opinion, how does creative expression help each of us heal? So creative expression, I feel, I feel like it very much helps us heal in a way where, um, you know, we're expressing how we feel, we're expressing our experiences, we're talking about things that um, have happened to us or continue to happen to us or you know, or will happen to us. And when I say will happen or have happened, I don't mean negative things. I mean, it could be positive experiences that you've had as well. And, but I think overall for me, art has always been um, kind of like a safe place where I can go to to talk about some of the things that you might not hear everybody talk about. Um, it's a really vulnerable space where you're allowing other people to see you completely naked. And you have to be willing to do that, you know. And and so for me in my practice as an as an artist, but also as a, as an educator and someone who goes out and encourages others to express, I feel like it. I can see when it when it heals or when it kind of it's therapeutic, right? Where you can't feel anything else but what you're making in that very moment, because creative process is very therapeutic, right? It's like a flower when it grows, you watch it. It's therapeutic, it's nature, it's growing. It's the same way when you make art. It's like, it's a very natural process. And in that, there, I feel like there's this godly kind of therapy that happens. Hmm. Uh, I would imagine in your, the way that you promote your art and the, with the collectives and everything, that, that you would feel that, um, I could be wrong, that it's, in, is, is, it, it's, is it just as important with the art that you do to be able in interviews and with uh, in panels and that to actually discuss your work? Is that important for an artist to know how to discuss their own work? I think being, um, you know, you ha I think you have to be able to speak about what you do. Um, and I think you have to be able to express not only with images, but also sometimes with words. And it doesn't mean you have to sit there and literally critique everything you did or go over everything you did, but eloquent speakers often are heard more than others. So it's, it's, it's being able to articulate what you do and being able, it doesn't mean you have to know what you're doing when you do it, but afterwards you should be able to kind of get a glimpse, whether it's from your own review of it or even other people telling you. I mean, I've done stuff where sometimes I didn't even know I did them and then someone would come and talk to me about it and I'd be like, oh wow, I didn't even know I did that. So it's, it's this kind of, you know, reflection and inner growth and, you know, and reading a lot. Like, mm -hmm. I find that when I study other artists, and me and Pat were talking about this yesterday, some of the things that we're really interested in as artists is looking at the way other artists live and mm -hmm. the way other artists' studios are set up, mm -hmm. right? Because everybody has their own practice and their own experience, but when you look and you see how other people speak or how other people act, especially in our world of art making, um, you, you get a glimpse of what they're doing and who they are and, and what they're kind of trying to do with their work. And I don't, I don't only feel like my work is my paintings and my collages and my installations. I feel like teaching is so much a part of my practice as an artist and as a, as a creative person where it, it, it's, an, it's enabling me to continue the conversation not only with the adults in the room but also with our future, right? Because we're going to grow and become older, but then we need to make sure that the younger ones also get it, right? Mm -hmm. Or they can also make some change in the world with positive messages and so on and so forth with their own voices. So, yeah, I kind of went off on that question a little but bit. But I think that's, I, I agree, I think that's, uh, it's, that's part of the art of being an artist is, is knowing how to communicate other things about art. Like you said, your studio, your processes to people that might be not just getting it from your paintings. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Cool. Um, so how, um, maybe could you talk specifically about the graffiti gallery show and how 
how it's been in Winnipeg, how your time has been in Winnipeg so far and at the gallery. Yeah, so it's really, I feel so thankful and so blessed. Um, you know, for years I have, you know, I've been traveling and doing my work and, and everywhere I go I meet new people and, and it's just such a wonderful experience, you know. And being in, you know, I've been to Canada but I haven't been to Winnipeg, so this is a, a first time kind of visit. Um, and the space is right up my alley. It's raw and industrial, just kind of the way I like it. I love creating work in abandoned spaces and spaces that are rugged. Um, so for me, this is like exactly what I love, you know. And Pat, you know, me and Pat have known each other, and he's really the person who invited me. We've known each other for quite some years now because we met at Art Basel um, in Miami, and we have, um, you know, we have kind of the same crew of friends and. So over the, over the years, I've seen each artist that has come that has been a friend of mine. And our missions are very much aligned in the work that we do within community and being able to encourage art for all types of kind of, whether uh, expression, whether it's music or dance or visual arts or graffiti or writing or, you know, so this is, this is kind of the space that I look to be in, right? I really look to be in a space that's inclusive to all and, and transformative in, in many ways where you can go in and do whatever you want and the gallery will support you and encourage you and, and the team is there for you, you know? So, you know, my experience overall has been amazing so far. Um, it's Wednesday, so tomorrow is the show. So, like, we have those three or four hours of crunch time work that we have to do right before the uh, exhibition opens, which is tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But um, I had some rest today, so I'm feeling really re-energized. And, um, and I feel really, really thankful to be here. Everyone has been so wonderful. And final question I'd like to ask all the artists. What advice do you have for young artists starting out? Like, what would be some key things that you should look forward to or think about as a young artist? So um, I would say um, some of the some of the kind of words that were told to me as a young artist was um, as even just as a young person was to always follow your dreams and to you know to dream very big so that you can attain those dreams and um, and also to really stay true to what you believe you know to yourself and what you believe and and to go after it and and always know that you know. You, you are the creator of your own world. So if you don't have, it's because you're inviting that into your world. So if, if you want, you have to kind of go and do the work for it. Um, I also, you know, I'm a big believer in knowledge and acquiring knowledge and reading. And if there's something I don't know, then I go out and search for it, uh, as opposed to, um, being fed in, you know, information, I really kind of search and do my research and go in and study. And, and I feel like, you know, I, uh, I don't know advice. Advice, I feel like uh, I always want to learn more and I'm forever going to be a student. So to be hungry. Yeah, it's to, it's to be, I think, hungry for knowledge and to want it, you know, to want to be better and to want to grow and to want to really, but overall, just to be yourself, like 100%, no matter how weird or quirky you're, but be the best self you can be.